Welcome to the National Council of Schools and Programs of Professional Psychology Summer 2020 Conference on Social Responsiveness and Leading Social Change Amidst Pandemics. Please welcome Dr. Francine Conway, President of the National Council of Schools and Programs of Professional Psychology, NCSPP, and the Dean of the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Tell me, Dr. Conway, what is NCSPP? Thank you, and welcome to the Summer 2020 Conference. This is a new format for us, and I'm sure that many professional organizations are experiencing this new virtual world. I thank you for attending our conference and look forward to spending today and tomorrow with you all. Now, NCSPP is an organization of schools and programs of professional psychology. Our programs have produced over 10,000 licensed psychologists in the past 10 years. We have member programs across the U.S. in 27 states, and it takes an average of 5.4 years for our students to complete their doctoral training. While doctoral training and education is our focus, NCSPP has a rich history relevant to the current social climate in which we educate and train health service and professional psychologists. A social climate shaped by dual pandemics, the health pandemic resulting from COVID-19 and the racial reckoning spurred by the murder of George Floyd. In many ways, NCSPP has been at the forefront of preparing psychologists to lead social change. Just a little bit about our history. The first CIDI program was started in 1968 by the late Don Peterson, who served as the first dean of the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. It was not until 1973, during the American Psychological Association-sponsored Vail Conference on professional education and training in psychology that the PsyD degree was endorsed as the recommended terminal degree for education and training in professional practice. Three years later, in 1976, under the leadership of Nicholas Cummings, who convened 19 professional schools for an all-day meeting the day before the APA convention, much like this meeting is occurring, the National Council of Schools and Professional Psychology was formed, and Gordon Derner, Dean of the Doctoral Psychology Program at Adelphi University, was elected as its first president. Now, you should know I have two connections to Don Peterson and to Gordon Derner. I'm currently the dean of the same school of applied and professional psychology that Don Peterson was, and I received my doctoral degree from Adelphi, which was the program led by Gordon Derner. So NCSPP has a very uh, special meaning for me and I'm deeply connected to this organization and its mission. Today, the council composed of delegates from over 70 APA accredited schools and programs of professional psychology across the US and Canada has provided the highest quality of graduate training in professional psychology. The education and training of professional psychologists has its foundation in the scientist practitioner model, also known as the Boulder model, developed in 1949. It's a training model for graduate programs that provide applied psychologists with a foundation in research and scientific practice. Now, over the years, many programs have varied in their emphasis but a key underpinning of psychologist training 
is not only providing therapeutic services informed by the consumption and application of research, but balancing clinical interventions with scientific exploration of their services and the results of those interventions. A distinguishing characteristic, however, of NCSPP schools is the embracing of a competency-based model, which originally identified six core competencies uh, areas. These include relationship, assessment, intervention, research, and evaluation, consultation and education, and management and supervision. The NCSPP model has influenced the field of psychology, largely led by Russell Brandt, George Stryker, and Joan Callahan, who successfully advocated for the use of outcome-based accreditation models to accredit all graduate programs. Today, Peterson's 1991 book, the core curriculum in professional psychology is the key reference for NCSBP programs. Now earlier I stated that NCSBP has been at the forefront of preparing psychologists to lead social change. NCSBP continued to demonstrate its commitment to social justice, diversity, and inclusion in some significant ways. For example, in 1989, NCSPP membership made a bold step to change the leadership structure of the organization to include representation of ethnic minorities in its governance structure. This commitment resulted in more diversity in programming in the organization. In 2002, NCSPP establishes diversity as a core competency. And since then, in 2004, advocacy has been an NCSPP professional value. In 2020, NCSPP included representation of individuals with disability in its leadership structure and the NCSPP Midwinter Conference in 2020 worked to identify training goals and learning outcomes that should be emphasized in the curriculum designed to prepare psychologists to be socially responsive and lead social change. The conference theme is social responsiveness and leading social change amidst pandemics. Why social responsiveness? Many values in the psychology profession are aligned with our professional imperative to be socially responsive. Psychologists recognizes and values human diversity. We recognize that the practice of psychology occurs in a complex matrix of intersubjective and intersecting social, political, and economic realities. We honor the validity of people's lived experiences as determined by social, political, and economic realities. In our training programs, especially NCSPP programs, primary training goals embrace a belief in shared power equal access to opportunities, social justice, affirmation of differences, and the prevention of marginalization. And more importantly, we believe that disadvantages propagated by differences in gender, physical status, spirituality or religion, sexual orientation and sexual identity, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, ability or disability, age, and others require a social response. What is a socially responsive psychologist? 
A socially responsive psychologist embraces the values I just discussed and can be thought of as someone who, on behalf of our clients, first acknowledge and then respond to social contributors adversely impacting their clients' well-being. Socially responsive psychologists take action to address social inequities. What are some of the issues psychologists need to respond to as socially responsive psychologists? Psychologists are well positioned to respond to inequity, inequality, marginalization, oppression, both systemic, interpersonal, and internalized oppression, violence and trauma, stereotype, bias, just to name a few. Earlier, you said a socially responsive psychologist takes action to address social inequalities. What can a socially responsive psychologist do? That's a very good question. What can a socially responsive psychologist do? Responsiveness requires taking action. Some examples of social responsiveness include activities such as becoming involved in political action, dissemination, sharing the knowledge we have gathered about how various inequities impact the mental health of oppressed and disenfranchised groups, working to increase access to quality mental health care. And for our scholars, it means conducting research that fosters health equity and to develop and maintain a socially responsible science becoming an advocate for services, rights, and social justice. And I think most importantly, as educators, we must educate and train our students in a progressive way that incorporates the advancement of inclusivity in our practice, in our scholarship, our communities, our academic communities, the profession, program development and evaluation. I have a good sense of what a socially responsive psychologist could do. How would you summarize what social responsiveness means for the organization in CSPP? What does social responsiveness mean to NCSPP? I would say that social responsiveness is inherent in the role of a psychologist. A quote from Wiener and Craighead 2010 captures NCSPP's position on social responsiveness. And they write, the primary purpose of education for professional psychology is preparation for the delivery of human services in a manner that is effective and responsive to the individual and societal needs, which recognizes and values human diversity. You have talked about some impressive values of professional psychologists and the importance of taking action when being socially responsive. What action has the organization taken and responding to the current social climate? First, I believe we must all recommit to doing better. Let's not shy away from engaging in an albeit painful and challenging conversation about race and racism. This commitment is reflected in the strong public statement we have made about the pandemic of racism, to echo the words of the APA president, Dr. Sandy Schulman. Second and most important is to name and call out injustice, racism, discrimination, ableism, and all forms of bigotry when we see it. 
This conference and many previous NCSPP conferences provides an opportunity for faculty to come together and have courageous conversations like the one scheduled during this meeting to share models of best practices for addressing racial injustice and inequity in our curriculum. For example, taking steps to decolonize our syllabus, another presentation that will be offered during this conference. During our midwinter conference in 2020, we developed the Social Responsiveness Training Matrix that identifies training benchmarks at the practica and internship levels. These benchmarks particularly emphasizes social responsiveness learning goals. We have three sessions during this meeting that gives an overview of how social responsiveness may be integrated into each of our competency areas. I'm also proud to say that the Executive Committee has endorsed a NCSPP-wide social action initiative being led by our next president-elect, Dr. Gilbert Newman. This initiative engages our students and faculty in a nonpartisan effort to get out the vote. With NCSPP programs and schools in 27 states, we can certainly have a collective impact in helping others to become civically engaged. And finally, this conference is dedicated to supporting our colleagues as they seek to be socially responsive in training the next generation of psychologists. The challenges of COVID and the racial reckoning presents an opportunity for us to reevaluate how we are educating and training our students. How do we become socially responsive as institutions in academic spaces? There needs to be a system of accountability. Having good intentions has never been sufficient and is no longer a satisfactory response. We must make an effort to institutionalize challenges through policy that will create more inclusive environments for our students, faculty, and staff. What about the COVID-19 pandemic? What are the challenges? And how do you see it impacting professional psychology? American higher education has survived two similar periods of potential threat. The first was a depression in the 1870s, and the second was the Great Depression of the 1930s. These inflection points were marked by colleges and university mergers and closures. And these were also times of adaptation and innovation. Certainly, the use of technology in training our students and the role of online learning for professional training has to be re-examined. While accrediting bodies, just like the rest of us, are doing their best to accommodate these realities, there will be a time in the near future when as a profession, we will need to align our practices with the new post-COVID realities. And in keeping with social responsiveness, we will need to advocate for the differential impact of COVID on students, faculty, and staff. As a training community, we have learned a lot from our experience responding to COVID. We're all preparing to return to educating our students through a combination of remote instruction, hybrid, and online courses, in-person and telepsychology service delivery, and have become experts in face masks, screenings, and building capacity that ensures social distancing. 
What does this mean for our future? We know there's a need for psychologists, especially given the mental health needs stemming from social isolation, loss and grief, unemployment and racism. Now we need to reconsider some issues that have been on the psychology training landscape with clarity of context. Is there a role for master's level trainees? How do we advocate for psychologists who are on the front lines? How do we attend to the wellness needs of our students? Is there a role for online education in preparing professional psychologists? What about the cost of education and rising student debt? What are some other models of competency-based education that we can consider? Is there a role for self-paced learning that allows students to work while pursuing their degree? And how do we ensure quality of education and building community in this new virtual space? And for the survival of training programs, what role can we serve in our institutions so that we are valuable contributors to our academic communities? These are all questions that we will wrestle with as a training community in the months and years to come. Thank you, Dr. Conway, for sharing your insights and for your leadership at this time. Any last comments as we close? I would like to end by sharing a story with you. It is the fable of long spoons, referenced in Dr. Yalom's book, An Expert on Group Psychotherapy. The gist of the story is that they were two groups of people with similar situations. They all had long spoons that could reach the pot of stew with more than enough for everyone. In group A, the individuals were sad because although they could reach the food, the spoons were too long for them to be able to feed themselves. In group B, everyone was happy and well fed. You see, they figured out how to feed each other. This is a time when we need to figure out the benefits of being fed and feeding others. It is our commitment to ourselves and to our communities. Thank you and enjoy the conference.